Okay, we are on the final part of the notes for this unit. There will be some other lessons that talk about some other things about cells, but um, as far as these notes go and that packet that's in your hand, um, this is the last part. Okay, so once this is done, you turn this in, but remembering that you also had to turn in that screenshot of the game that you played after the first part of the notes. And if you still need to do that, um, or if you lost your screenshot and you need to do it again and get a, uh, a score with your name on it, a score sheet that has to have your name on it, you were able to type your name in, okay? And that's what I, the directions told you to do. Um, then you can always go back to the link and do it again, okay? But it's a good, and it's a good thing to do again in the future anyway because it's fun and um, it's a good refresher for like before the test, okay? So we're talking about microscopes now. We're gonna learn about uh, three or four different kinds of microscopes. Um, we are only gonna be using this one, but um, as a biology student, you need to be familiar with several other kinds. So when we see pictures, of biological things, um, we know how those pictures uh, came about, all right? So the, the first kind of microscope, uh, and make sure you get your notes filled in here, is um, our light microscopes. And they just use light. You could use, uh, now back in the day, the school microscopes had uh, a little mirror on the bottom, and you just bent the mirror so the light from either a window or from the ceiling would bounce off and go up into the um, specimen to see what you were seeing. Nowadays, they're all plug in and they're over there, they're right over there against the wall. So, um, and you just adjust the light. Uh, and that's, that's, it's got one lens here called an ocular lens and then another lens here to, melt, to help combi combine together to help magnify the tiny images that are on the sides that we're going to be looking at. Um, because the light has to pass up through the slide. You'll see another one where the light um, does not do that. Okay, the light goes down on, on it, it's different. And the specimens have to be very small uh, and or very thin for this type of microscope to work. Um, if, the, if you're gonna be viewing a larger specimen, I don't know, let's say you wanted to view a, um, the, the tissues of a stem of a tree or something, you couldn't just put a piece of wood in there, right? You'd have to slice extremely thin, thinner than a piece of paper um, that you're writing on, thin, and then look at it, okay? We're hopefully gonna look at a few things that are like paper, we might even actually look at the fibers of paper or hair or cloth uh, just to see what they look like under a microscope. And they can be viewed alive. That's, that's what's good about this microscope is you can have living specimens. You can go out and get some pond water or something like that, or even blood, whatever you're looking at, um, and put it under a microscope with a microscope slide with a little, little bit of water and you could see the little critters moving around in there. So that's, and it won't kill them. Um, and to make something stand out, like to see the organelles in certain cells, you might have to add a stain. And um, there are different color stains for different types of organisms. So um, let's see, let's take a look at that, okay? So these are the kind of things that you can see with a regular light microscope that we have right here in the classroom. Um, if you went and got out and got some pond water, you might see some of these things here, these organisms like algae and little um, swimming organisms with cilia, the little hair-like projections, right? Um, this is bacteria being engulfed or eaten by a, a white blood cell. Now, bacteria would be, might be kind of hard to see in, in one of these microscopes. You'd have to use a very special uh, skill that we're actually not going to learn in this class. We definitely will, will be able to see um, larger cells. Okay? And then this is one cell. We haven't learned about this yet, but this is one cell that is replicating itself, splitting down the middle, splitting all of its organelles and DNA, and then making 
two cells. And that's how your cells reproduce themselves. That's how you grow. You, in order to grow, you have to make more cells, right? And we know that cell theory tells us that cells only come from other cells, right? Or if you get a cut, how does your body heal itself? This way. It splits the cells that aren't damaged into more cells to replace the missing tissue. To a point, we can't replace like, if you cut your finger off right here, or your arm, you know, you, or you, you know, if you uh, have a lung damaged, our bodies don't, don't reproduce that well. So just minorly, you could actually lose maybe the tip of your finger, the very tip, and, and your body could grow that back. But once it gets involved with bone and things, your body just won't do it. They're working on it because they know that other organisms can do that, like um, um, you know, some certain lizards and certain uh, marine organisms. So if they can figure out how to make our genetic code reproduce like that, we might be able to grow back limbs and body and organs. That'd be pretty cool. So a stereoscope or a dissecting scope is a little bit different. You can see that there's no light source or at least the light source is not from below, it's from above, okay? So this is the, and it has two uh, lenses for looking at, and you put the object here in like a, um, a dish, and it's for looking at much larger objects, and you can see the 3D structures of specimens, and you can also look in there and manipulate and dissect something if it needed to be dissected for one reason or another. That's why it's called a dissecting microscope. A stereoscope, because it has two eyepieces, two lenses, two ocular pieces, and you see you have to adjust them both, like, like binoculars almost. And then this is a height adjuster, and it's got a second um, um, lens adjuster as well, okay? It's very easy to use. Um, like I said, light source is, is above, not uh, above, sorry, not below. And then the specimen does not have to be thin. It could be, it could be a sea star or something. It doesn't have to be thinned out. So here's the types of things that you could see with a dissecting microscope. So if you wanted to study the mouth parts of a bee, for example, or the um, seed structure, of, this is a pepper, a cross section of like a, a jalapeno pepper, okay? This is a flatworm called a planaria. And you can tell this is a 40 times um, magnification. So it's magnifying 40 times. Those other ones from that previous microscope, those are magnified like 100 times, a lot more. And this is the surface structure of a leaf, obviously. And you'd be able to see some pretty amazing things if you change the light. We're gonna see that in the future, okay? The last kind of microscope is an electron microscope. There's different kinds of electron microscopes, but for the main purposes of this class, just know that this is one that can magnify up to a million times. They have used electron microscopes to look at atoms, okay? Like big atoms, not little atoms like hydrogen or oxygen, but big atoms like gold. You could see a sheet with bumps, and the sheet is a sheet of atoms, and the bumps are individual uh, atoms. So it's pretty amazing how far our technology has gotten us. What they do here is they bombard the surface of a specimen with electrons, which are very tiny, and they travel like virtually the speed of light, so it's like a type of light, but electricity is a flow of electrons, so it's kind of, you know, that kind of energy. And um, the specimen has to be dead, though, because obviously bombarding something with this much energy would kill it anyway. So they have to preserve the specimen a certain way in order to, typically they have to coat it with like a metal, uh, like gold, for example. They coat it with something. It's very expensive, very difficult to use. You can see the whole setup here um, of an, a, a relatively new electron microscope. But look at some of the things you can see with an electron microscope. This is a scanning electron microscope. So you see these 3D images. It looks, can only look at the surface of what you're looking at. Now, if you wanted to cut the specimen in half and look at that surface, the, the inside, you can do that as well. 
but it can't see through is what I'm trying to say. But it gives a very fine detailed image of the surface of, of your specimen that you're looking at. <clears throat> and so this is a pollen grain. This is a, uh, a f well, I don't know what that is actually. Some kind of mite, it's a mite. Like the ones that live inside your eyelashes. Yes, they do live in there. Here's some red blood cells. Very detailed. Now the color is added. All the color is added. It gives black and white images and then you'd, you'd um, artificially color them afterwards with, you know, some sort of program. This is a water bear. It's also called a tardigrade. These organisms are um, amazing. They can live. They can live without water for like very long time, hundreds of years, maybe even longer. They can live in space. They can live in, you know, all these extreme places because they shrivel up and they hibernate. They're not mammals, obviously. They're microscopic organisms. They don't quite look like a bear. I don't know why they call them, they call them water bears. They also call them something pig, pond pig or something like that anyway. And you may remember if you saw Ant-Man, um, one of these guys was in Ant-Man. They, they portrayed one of these as a attacking Ant-Man when he got to the very small level, but I'm not sure that they would do that. <laughs> <clears throat> Here's a flea from a cat. <clears throat> Very bad critters. So these are the biting mouth parts right here. These are the legs that enable them to jump really far, even though they're really tiny. Spring-loaded legs. And the hard outer coating that even if you, you know, try to squish it, you can't. You have to, like, pop it with like a tool or your nails or something like that. If you have pets, you know what I'm talking about. Pollen, look at the different kinds of pollen grains. Pollen is essentially plant sperm. It's the male reproductive genetic code that's sent out and it touches the, when it lands on the female part of the flower or a plant elsewhere, floats in the air and lands, then it can fertilize. We'll learn more about plants and fertilization uh, later in the class. But they come in all different species, so they all have different shapes of pollen. And that's the stuff that you breathe in and <coughs> she, you know, cough and sneeze and get allergies from. Plant sperm floating around in the air. This is the lining of your lungs. We talked about ciliated um, cells. Remember the cilia that propelled the paramecium, like the, the little creature that looks like a slipper, a uh, hairy slipper swimming around? And I told you that we have these as well in our lungs. Well, this is what they look like up, uh, for real up close. And you can see pieces of microscopic dust trapped in the cilia. And it will collect that and then mix it with mucus so that you can get rid of it. Your body can get rid of it and not get... Otherwise, that stuff will build up in our lungs and our lungs would stop working, right? This is a light bulb filament, the tiny squiggly wire inside of a light bulb that gets hot and gives off light when you turn the electricity on. Those are the older light bulbs. They're called incandescent light bulbs. The newer ones are all LEDs and they don't give off a lot of heat, nor do they use as much energy, so they're better. And this is actually the material um, that um, Einstein, not Einstein, um, who is the guy who invented the light bulb again? You remember, call it out if you remember. Um, anyway, he went through all different kinds of materials and um, finally came up with the one element, tungsten, it's letter W on the periodic table. Um, and he figured that that's, he found out that that was the best to make light bulbs with. All right. And then this last one's called the transmission electron microscope. It's still a, an electron microscope. Um, but it's able to look at two-dimensional things, gives you, and it gives you, uh, you can look at the internal structures of cells. So all the organelles that we have been learning about, once this technology became available, they were able to really get a better picture of um, cells in general and the layout of all the organelles and what they actually look like and 
what their processes are, okay? And again, but it can't be used to live, used for living things because of those electrons bombarding it would kill it anyway, right? So here's a chloroplast with the stacks of um, thylakoids inside, okay? Those pancake stacks of, of called grana, and they will, um, or granum, those are the things that are the, full of green pigment that are turning sunlight and carbon dioxide and water into glucose molecules. They lock up that sun's energy in the bonds that hold together a glucose molecule, right? So that's how we know the structure of a chloroplast. And this is the structure of a mitochondria, which is a very similar uh, organelle in animal cells and plant cells too. Because plants at nighttime, they don't, do, they don't do photosynthesis. They do respiration like we do. So they use their own glucose in the same process that we use glucose as food. So they make their own food, right? They don't just keep making food and never use it. When the sun goes down, they switch and they do what we do. Most people don't know that. And then they switch back when the sun comes back on to make more food. And they're continually using the food as they make it and storing it. And you can see these folds in the mitochondria and that's where um, uh, energy, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the molecule that pro pro stores and provides energy for the cell functions, right? Okay. Oh, uh, wait, we still have two more. Wait, okay. Next, what's going on here? Okay, sorry. Here's the stains I was talking about before. Um, they make cells, uh, parts of cells, stand out more visibly, okay? So uh, if, if you're gonna be doing a plant, like um, an onion skin, like you wanted to look at the cells of a, an onion or some other very thin plant-like material, you would use iodine to, and it would turn it this yellowy orange color, and then you'd be able to see the cell walls, and these are the nuclei in each of the cells, and other organelles would, would stand out as well. If you're gonna be using an animal cell, like, if, for example, you wanted to scrape the inside of your cheek um, with a, a popsicle stick, a clean one, and then you could take whatever's on the end of that stick. It wouldn't be like a big glob. It would be, you'd barely be able to see anything at all. Look, it would look like spit. And you'd be able to put that on a slide. You could put it under the microscope, and then you'd put a little drop of this methylene blue stain, and, that, and it would look like this. And you'd be able to see the... Uh, cell parts of your cheek cells, for example, among many other uses. And then um, your job now is you have the very last thing in your notes is to label a telescope like the one we have in class. And so all the parts are here. Um, base, I don't know, that got a little messed up down there, but that's just one word, base. Light source, iris diagram, diaphragm, sorry. Diaphragm means that it... Uh, opens and closes to different um, widths to let in different amounts of light, depending upon what you're looking at. So I'm gonna pause the video here. My counterpart over there is going to pause the video on this so that you can label this uh, in your notes, okay? And then we're going to be uh, doing something else. Well, we, yeah, after this, okay? All right.